God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. I was walking uh, through a store this weekend, and they had a whole team of employees out busily setting up the Christmas aisle of lights and decor and decorations and reindeer, which means we're entering that time of year when the Hallmark Channel and Netflix are filled with sappy, poorly written holiday romance movies. There's something about Christmas time, which I'm pretty sure is still a while off, <laughs> but there's something about Christmas time that makes people want to watch people falling in love. And yet, when we talk about Christianity, the faith that believes in Jesus Christ, and its teachings on marriage, I think a lot of folks don't think first about people falling in love so much as rules that kind of come to mind. Probably a few rules like you shouldn't sleep with someone unless you're married to them, or a marriage should be lifelong and not end in divorce, or a marriage is between one man and one woman, not people of the same gender, right? Sometimes we, we get caught up in these rules, and you've got to stop and think, well, is that, is that the heart of Christian marriage, it's Christian teaching on marriage? It doesn't feel like a magical Hallmark movie. And if you put those two in competition against each other, love and magic in the air and, you know, snow falling on Central Park, and a couple of rules, there's not much question which one of those is going to win out in people's hearts. So I think we can dig deeper in today's scriptures and get to the heart, the heart of Christian marriage. What's behind some of the talk and debate that we hear so much about in, in this day and age, especially in our own time and, and society. So let's do that. Let's look at this. Right? We start with Genesis, right, in today's readings. And the setting is creation, right? And not creation as a thing, creation as an action. This divine creative moment where the artist who created the entire universe is creating everything. Right? I love that in, in the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis's Aslan sing creation into being. Right? This is beauty incarnate, flowing, creating, coming into being. This is the backdrop of our reading this morning. That's the setting for the first wedding ever. And I think we know that in our hearts as humans, even non-Christians. I think we know that because across time, across cultures, weddings are celebrated. Right? There's a feast, there's music, there's dancing, there's color, there's celebration. We know that this is a big deal. There's something beautiful going on here. We recognize that in our bones. And we see that in this first wedding of Adam and Eve. Right? And then, what does the man say to the woman at this moment, at this wedding moment? Right? The Bible has a lot of poetry in it. This is the first poem we get in the Bible, right here in Genesis 2. And it's a love poem. Right? This, at last, is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Right? This could be like a hit scene on a Broadway musical right here. Imagine the swelling of the music, right? singing this lyric, the backdrop of creation like unfolding, coming into existence. And then the narrator of Genesis kind of pops in, says, hey, by the way, that's why a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Right? More poetry. They shall become one flesh. In just a few words, we get so much beauty. We get love. We get union, right? And union is not just communion, next, two things next to each other in that sense. It is two things 
There were two things, now they're one. It's this deep uniting into one. It's mystical. It's poetry, but it's not metaphor. Right? This is what marriage is. Two become one. And then we get this earlier in Genesis 1. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blesses them. And this is one of the, like, the great themes of the Eden wedding, is that God is extending blessing upon this couple. And he says, in this blessing, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Right? This blessing in it, God unites man and woman for two distinct things. One is to rule over the world. And who rules over the world but the king? Who's the king? The creator who made it. And he's inviting humanity in this man and woman, who are the parents of all humanity, to join him in that like, kingly ruling. And it's a ruling of love. Right? It's the ruling of an artist who cherishes what they've created. So he's inviting humanity into kingly authority when he's just made this world. And that would be amazing. Right? That would be like a huge gift. But on top of that, he brings this couple together. They immediately fall in love, like love at first sight. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And then God gives them a gift and a vocation. And this is so important to the Christian understanding of marriage. It's not just, you know, you're cute, I'm cute, let's date and maybe spend forever together if it works out, right? No, it's, there's a vocation, there's a calling, there's a gift here and a blessing. It says, be fruitful and multiply, right? And lots of other species in creation procreate. Right? Even flowers reproduce. We see that in all of nature that has this grace. But only humans create new eternal souls made in the image of God. So Christian marriage has this vocation to join in creation. So we're not only ruling over the rest of creation, we're actually joining in the mystery of creating new life, new souls who will have eternal life. Right? That's just mind-blowing that we get that opportunity. And it's not just a task, it's a blessing. It's a wedding blessing that God speaks over this couple. So to recap, Christian thought on marriage, not just a bunch of rules, but cosmic beauty, Right? Joy, like welling up from the depth of our souls. Love poetry. Right? Union, two become one. Royal king and queen themes. A divine blessing. Joining God in this amazing act of creating new life. That sounds way better than a couple of rules. <laughs> and it sounds way better, I think, than anything the Hallmark Channel is going to throw at us this year. So, let's look back at these rules then. Why do we have them? Where do they come from? We need to look at the rules that we talk so much about, that we hear so much about, in light of this Eden wedding in Genesis. Again, I think two common rules we hear and think about, and they're not bad rules, don't sleep with someone you're not married to. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Why? Does it really matter? I think this is a common question. I think even as Christians, we ask, does it really matter? Right? Well, first, yes, it does really matter. We'll talk about why. I think a lot of times, when we're talking about moral questions, is it right or wrong? Is it really wrong? One of the first questions we ask is, is anyone actually being hurt here? Right? That's a good first question. And that is the primary way that our culture today, not just in the U.S., kind of all over the world at this point, the primary way the modern world figures out what's right and wrong. Is anyone being hurt? Right? That is a great first question. It has never been Christianity's last question to figure out what's right or wrong. 
we continue on. Okay, no one's being hurt. Good. Maybe it's okay. Maybe it's right. <laughs> Maybe it's not wrong. But is it part of the divine creative plan that God intended at creation when he unfolded the foundations of the earth? That's a whole other question. That's a whole other way of getting to moral questions of what's right and wrong. And then right and wrong doesn't become kind of a superimposed set of rules that I have to kind of abide under by like an iron fist. It becomes a deeper understanding of where joy is found, what we're, we were created for, what this is all about, right? What's the purpose of life, right? The great question. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you've probably read the book or maybe seen the movie, written by a very witty atheist who famously answered that question, 42. <laughs> Meaning, there ain't one. There's no purpose to life. We're just kind of here. We enjoy it. We try to be nice while we're here and civil. Right? That's, not, that's not the Christian thought. And the purpose of life is tied to every decision we make. Right? And that's not just private individual decisions. If, if the scriptures, as the church has said, has something to say to the most intimate parts of people's lives outside the church, then we have to accept that it also has something to say to those most intimate parts of life to us inside the church. So let's come back to this on marriage. What is marriage about? Why aren't we intimate with people that we're not married to? Right? Or why this insistence on gender of one man and one woman for life? Does it really matter? Well, I think one of the hallmarks of the modern world has also been trying to separate sex and babies. Right? We're like insistent that these things don't have to be a part of each other. It's almost as if fertility is seen as like a really unfortunate thing that we're trying to like get rid of, you know. Um, that's not the Christian understanding, right? The Christian understanding is this is the wedding blessing from God to participate in this mystical, miraculous thing called creation. There wasn't someone, and now there is. That's, a, that's mind-blowing. That, was, that is the personal history of each one of us in this room. There was a time where we did not exist. And God didn't just snap his fingers and we popped into view. No. We had parents who, in one way or another, participated in that creation. And that means that there's a family unit. right? And so, in one way, to, to have intimacy sexual intimacy with someone outside of marriage is not just to put the cart before the horse, although it is kind of maybe putting the steps of intimacy out of order, but there's something deeper about it. It's sharing in this incredible act of creation where two have become one. And that's what a kid is, by the way. A child is the manifestation of two become one flesh. That's why you can look at a kid and say, wow, she looks like just like her dad. Wait, she looks just like her mom. How does that work? And her grandfather for some reason, you know? It's, it's literally two people become one flesh in this child, right? That is the expression of that union of marriage. So to be intimate with someone we're not married to is to grab a hold of that intimacy and union without actually fully expressing it with your whole being, right? It's kind of giving part of yourself to someone without giving your entire life to them and receiving their entire life back as a gift. So there's this total disconnect between union, but not quite, right? I was at a wedding once where the wedding vows, they'd written their own vows, and they said, we, we have two separate cups side by side, as long as they shall last together. It's like, it was like a very clear statement of we are together with our separate lives as long as this lasts, right? Now, that's not in the prayer book, so <laughs> that's not our understanding of marriage, right? But that is an excellent kind of illustration of a lot of the world's understanding of marriage, kind of a, a temporary relationship, there's not a hope 
that it can last because so often it doesn't apart from the grace of God, right? And it's an excellent illustration of what we're talking about with this intimacy outside of marriage, right? There's, there's a kind of a, a fear or a barrier or not totally giving of self. But finally, you know, there's a sense in which um, because this fertility is part of the wedding gift and vocation of marriage, um, this is where the gender comes in, right? That part of two becoming one flesh and that manifesting in a child, we see the scriptures tell us both in the Old and the New Testament that this is a relationship designed for one man and one woman to become one flesh who then have that expressed in a child. I have heard so often, so often, I believe uh, about gender and marriage um, what Jesus taught in the New Testament, and it doesn't say anything. Well, that's not true, first of all, um, but that also like separates the Old Testament, that idea from the New Testament, and Jesus calls, when he talks about the scriptures, he's not talking about the New Testament, he's talking about what we call the Old Testament. That was the scriptures when he was walking around the earth, right? When Paul continues writing letters talking about the scriptures, he's talking about what we call the Old Testament. That is the foundation of the new. The new doesn't cut away the old, throw it out, overwrite it. Right? It fulfills it in some ways, and we see some things develop. But the teaching at creation doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. This means that the rules don't become like something that we hammer into people, right? Something that we use almost as a weapon. And I imagine we've all seen this. <laughs> the rules being used as a, a weapon to explain to other people why you're wrong and I'm right. Now the rules become a teaching. Right? They become a teaching, a revelation of God's heart and wisdom. Right? God is both love. The hymn we just sang talked about God's love. We hear about that a lot. God's power we talk about that a lot. Something that we've forgotten in the modern age for some reason is God's wisdom. It's a major attribute of God throughout the Bible and throughout our hymns. Right? And the rules that we call morality are revelations of God's wisdom. And if he's truly wise, then it's good counsel to live by. It's good counsel to share with other people. And sharing it with them is an act of love. Right? It's an act of love. That's why Paul said, if you share total truth without love, you're just a clanging gong. May we never be clanging gongs on something so intimate and personal for, for everyone. So this holiday season, which I'm still convinced is a long way off, <laughs> but as it begins at Walmart and CVS and everywhere else apparently, if you're drinking hot cocoa, watching a sappy Hallmark movie on Netflix or any, any other channel, let those stories of love and romance and excitement around Christmas time, which is about the birth of Jesus, right, they're still not disconnected. It's okay that there are romantic Christmas movies because let those movies remind you that for all of us, whatever age we are, whether we're married or single, right, Christmas and marriage are deeply connected because marriage is the sign of God's love for us so that we may become one with him in the sacraments, right? in baptism, in holy communion. We are becoming one with that God who loves us so deeply that we have new life. These are deeply connected. So let Hallmark preach the gospel to you, even if it doesn't know that. And this holiday season, maybe around the Thanksgiving table, where Debates get kind of hot sometimes. If marriage and gender and these topics are coming up and the conversation is getting heated, maybe you can be the one to bring that non-anxious presence, that loving presence, who's sharing the love and power and wisdom of God with others. God bless you.